There's 101D, right? Um, I don't have the internet, so I don't have the schedule. Make sure I'm in the right room. Who's in mind that 101D? Well, what are you looking for? Well, I'm up here first. Someone else's schedule said there is, but so this room is double booked, it looks yeah. like. Okay. So they haven't announced what they're going to do? Uh, no, it's the first time hearing about it. Okay. Yeah, the only thing is it seems like there's, on the schedule, there's two sessions listed for this room at this time. So I don't have the printed one on me but in people's phones. I don't know. What's the app say? Says I'm double. I'm going to give the first dual session at DrupalCon. It's going to be DrupalCon first. Oh, yeah. That's true. I'm here. So, all right, thank you. Yeah, they're hanging out by the door there. It's not a very inclusive use of the space. This session is short enough where I don't have too many bad jokes. So. All right, I'm going to get started. Um, so if you're using the app to view the schedule, it seems on the app this room is double booked. Um, so if you're not here for inclusive mindsets, you should totally stay because you're only going to benefit from it. So if it's not the talk you're looking for, you know, be open to new ideas. Uh, have a, come on, have a seat. Um, I'd appreciate it. Uh, but thank you, everyone, uh, for coming to my session. Uh, I really appreciate having the chance to talk to you about this subject. It's something that I really care about. 
And before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Mike Miles. I am from Boston, Massachusetts. I help run the Boston Drupal group there. I've been working with Drupal for about 10 years. I do everything under the sun when it comes to Drupal. Um, during the day, I work as the Senior Technical Solutions Manager, it's a long title, uh, for a digital uh, interactive agency, a digital marketing agency called Genuine. I've been there for about nine years in my Drupal tenure uh, career. Uh, Genuine, we're a full service digital agency and what we do is we make, we build agile brands that stay culturally relevant. Uh, we make them easier to love for, for their users. And we do this by leveraging our full service capabilities that we have in-house from digital strategy to design to UX to video production um, and development across a number of technologies, not just Drupal. Drupal's just a small part of what we do, but it's like 99% of what I do. And we have offices in Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, and New York. Uh, at night, I run the Developing Up podcast, which is a podcast focused on the non-technical side of being a developer. So if you're a developer out there, anything about your development career that's not about code is what we cover in our subjects on the podcast. We just released an episode yesterday on leadership skills. Uh, so check it out if you're a developer, or if you're not, you know, share it with a friend. If you want to know any more about me, you can find me anywhere on the internet, MikeMiles86. Uh, since this is a short session, I'm not going to give you the full spiel, but you can find me on Twitter, on Drupal.org, on YouTube, uh, Google+, Plus. I probably still have, um, if you want to go there. So I believe that everyone in this room, we have one thing in common. No, it's not our love for Drupal, that's just a given, so I won't even count that. Uh, it's that no matter what we do every day, you know, we work in the digital world, and if you're a developer, if you're a designer, if you're a UX experience designer, uh, if you're a product manager, a project manager, every day we want to make a positive impact on as many people as possible. How many people here would raise their hand and agree this is ultimately what they try to do? Yeah, everybody in the room, that's excellent, like 100%. Uh, I don't think anyone seeks out on their day-to-day -to, -day to say, all right, how am I going to make someone's day worse by building something? Uh, right? Whether you're building something for your company, whether you're building something for a client, you're trying to see how can I build something that's going to make a better impact on the users? How am I going to make it so users want to come back to this product website, come back to our mission statement? How am I going to make that positive impact? And this is great. This is something we all want to strive for. And one of the things we do for this, especially for reaching a positive impact of users, is we think about accessibility needs, or at least I would hope a lot of us think about accessibility needs. By that I mean paying attention to vision and hearing impairments, cognitive ability, mobility, ability to use a mouse or a keyboard. When we build our digital products, we think about these, these topics and we make sure our products work for these users with these differences. The issue is though, humans differ on way more subjects than just this. They differ on location, on gender, on language, on their education levels, on their age, a whole number of metrics that are way beyond accessibility. And all these differences, which are covered under the idea of inclusive design, they change how we interact with the digital world. They impact how we experience the web and the products on there. So they change how our users reach our content and how we can make an impact on our users. So the idea uh, behind inclusive design is building something to make the biggest impact on the greatest number of people as possible. It came from um, actually building in the physical world and it's been carried into the digital world. And there's a lot of ways to do inclusive design and with this short talk, what I want to share with you is what I consider my four pillars for an inclusive mindset. Four ideas that you can apply to any one of your projects, no matter what your role is, to make sure you're making a positive impact on as many people as possible. So I created Commons 4.0 of this for you, so feel free to steal it and share it out. Uh, my four pillars of inclusive design or inclusive mindsets that I apply to my projects is one, that no user is average, that every user deserves equal access, to provide understandable content for every user, and that every user deserves our trust and respect. Four important pillars that if we apply to our projects, it's gonna make a world of difference. Hopefully I'll prove that to you. So no user is average. If we were to assume that every user is average, it, it, seems, like, it seems like the thing to do, right? You, you figure out who your users are by doing user studies or tests or just making assumptions. You find the middle ground, you say, I'm gonna build for these people. That way I'm gonna reach the most number of people possible. I'm accounting for you know, the bell curve in the middle. There's this great talk though by Todd Rose uh, titled The Myth of Average. It's a TED talk. 
And in his talk, he explains that if you design for the average, you are literally designing for nobody. I have a bit.ly link uh, to his talk here. Uh, and if you think about this statement for a second, it makes sense. If you are planning for what's the average user like, how can I build for the average user, there's no one of your users in reality who is that average person, who hits all the, those average marks. Everyone falls on a spectrum um, of the degrees you're trying to target. So if we want to build for our users, we have to throw out the idea of the average user and recognize all our users have actual differences. We need to capture those from the onset of our project. How do we do this? There's a number of ways to do it. One way that I think is very easy and simple to implement is creating personas with limitations. How many people here have heard of personas or use personas in their work? All right, great number of the room, 85, 90%. So a persona is put a, basically putting a story, a face, a name to a type of user and giving that to everyone on your project, from your client to your designers to your developers, and saying, build for this person. So to our personas, we could list simple limitations that everyone has to build against. For example, this persona has red-green color blindness, uh, such as I do. And that's going to impact from your design what colors you use to emphasize things. It's going to change how you approach your project. It's a simple line that makes a big impact so that you're building something that works for a person with something they can't control as limitation uh, to people who don't have that. Or what about has a broken wrist due to a skiing accident? This is like a temporary disability. Uh, you want your CEO who's visiting your site to be able to make it to the donation page without using a mouse because of this. If you throw this in there, you have to consider that situation. Someone doesn't have a mouse, doesn't have the ability to touch, uh, to navigate. Or does most of their work while traveling? This puts our persona in a, a scenario where they're very distracted, they're cramped, they're uncomfortable, they have a small screen, they can only pay attention to a little bit of information. That's gonna drastically change how you approach your content design and how you approach your UX and what's important to the user. Three simple sentences to add that have a big impact that suddenly if you build for these differences, is going to change how you approach your project. And you're gonna throw an assumption that it's someone who can see the full spectrum of color, has full mobility, and is in a nice, lazy, easygoing situation. So if we use personas with limitations, it's gonna help us get past that idea of average. The second pillar, every user deserves equal access. If we believe that every user deserves equal access, we have to throw out the idea that we can assume where our users are located, we can assume what devices they're using, and we can assume the speed they have to access our products. There's this interesting uh, statistic from, it's from 2016, but in 2016, 45% of internet browsing was from a desktop. That means 55% came from mobile devices or other devices. This means for majority of our users, we don't know how they're accessing our applications, our websites. We don't know where they are when they're doing it or what their speed is. So we can't assume they have a lot of data, that they have a big screen. We have to take into account how they're accessing and the differences therein. So how can we change our workflow to adjust for this? Well, we can structure our markup, our content, our UX in a way that makes sense. If we can't know the device that the person's using, we can know the rules that all devices use to read data from the web and build for that. One great way is using semantic markup. Uh, semantic markup is the rule set around HTML tags and reasons when you should use each tag. There's a small company you might have heard of called the BBC. They run some TV stations. Um, they have open sourced their semantic markup which they state from everything from an emphasis tag to an H1 header, everything in between, when to use it and why. And all their digital products follow it. It's open source, you can follow it too. Using semantic markup guarantees that no matter what device is reading your content, it's gonna read it in the proper order. It's gonna know that an H1 tag means a title and it is a title. We can use progressive design to deliver our experiences and get back to the idea to remember that Designs on our websites are not there to make things look pretty. They're there to highlight what is important to the user. So start with the very bare minimum, and I know the, develop, uh, the designers out there are gonna hate me for saying this, but do the bare minimum you can for design for highlighting what's important to the user. And then as you learn about where your users are coming from, you collect real world data, as you start to analyze using tools what connections they have, you can add on top of that experience, add flashy design elements, bigger images, 
um, you know, JavaScript, and you can progressively make the experience better, but you start with the bare minimum that looks great for everybody. And then we can prioritize what needs to be loaded. Uh, does your website need to load that third-party JavaScript library to work? Can it work without it? Does it need to have retina images? Uh, what about people who don't even load images who are using you know, screen readers? Uh, is that imperative for delivering your message? If it's not, figure out a way to prioritize it, how it's being loaded on the page so the most important things uh, load first. Third pillar, to pro provide understandable content to every user. If we agree to provide understandable content to every user, we have to all admit to a fundamental truth of the internet. Uh, to us, our projects, we love the code, we love the algorithms we do, we love the design, the UX. Uh, we we want to show them off to our friends. We come to conferences to tell everybody, look at the clever thing I did. But to our users, they only care about one thing, and that's information. They only come to our products, our websites for content. Content is king as it always has been. So if we want to make a positive impact on as many people as possible, it, it stands to reason that we want to write our content that is understandable by as many people as possible. Some ways we can do this is make sure all the content we write is clear and direct. When we can, we want to avoid jargon and use simple phrasing. Don't use 300 words when you can use two words. What's the simplest way to say something that gets your message across? We should pay attention to our font, our spacing, and our line length. For font, if you're using a serif font, for people who have uh, dyslexic issues, or on small screens, those serifs are gonna to run together. A word's gonna be hard to read. If your letter spacing is really tiny, word's gonna to run together. It's gonna to be hard for them to understand what you're trying to, to um, say to them. So use sans serif fonts uh, with some basic line spacing. Uh, that makes it easy to read from far away from a small device uh, for someone who uh, has a hard time reading words. That's a really bad way to say that sentence. Uh, and then line length. It's interesting, people on the internet, do you, does everyone here know how people on the internet read content? It's in an F pattern. What this means is, someone comes to your website, they read the first line of text, they read the second line of text, they read half of the third line, quarter of the fourth line, a quarter of the fifth line, they start to scan. So if we're cramming as much content as we can on a page, there's a great deal, of, there's a great chance that people are gonna start to miss what's important. Again, this goes back to simple phrasing and line length. What's the minimum we can say to get our point across? And finally, we can be meaningful with our content. We can use tools to check the readability score. So readability, it's not the education level someone has, but it's about the amount of mental effort it takes to understand what is being presented. There are algorithms that will check readability scores for you, and the ideal one nowadays is what's considered a sixth grade reading level. That provides content that is uh, complex enough that experienced users or native speakers will not get bored with the content, but simple enough so that those who are not native speakers or not used to the material will not get discouraged and will be able to understand it. Uh, it's almost like the less they have to think about it, the more they're gonna absorb, the less we're gonna give them mental fatigue. One of the tools I like to use for readability, and I do it from everything from my tweets to my emails to client communications to the content if I have to write it for, for websites, uh, is HemingwayApp.com. There's many other tools that you can use, but Hemingway App is a great online resource. Put your content in there. It's gonna highlight complex sentences, hard to read sentences. It's gonna highlight phrases that could be done simply or more simply. Um, and it's gonna not catch everything for you, but it's gonna give you an idea how complicated, how much energy does my content take to understand? Can I simplify it? And then pillar number four, to provide every user with trust and respect. Just as with the last pillar, we had to acknowledge that content is the most important to the users. What's most important to us is our users' information. But we also have to understand that it's their information they own it, they control it, we're just usually asking for that data to view it. So if we want that information, we have to give the users a reason why they can trust us with the data, because trust is really hard to get on the internet nowadays, and we have to respect who they are. So one of the ways I got interested in inclusive design was actually from this talk called Inclusive Design Excluding No Gender by Sarah Lirin, who's a UX developer out of Sweden, I wanna, I wanna say. Um, and what Sarah Laren talks in her talk, uh, 
one of the statements is, the easiest way to do inclusive design is stop asking about gender. And the great idea behind this, if you abstract it, is thinking about what information do you need to collect and why. So what Sarah does when she has a client and she sees a form on their website that's asking a gender question, she stops them and says, why are you collecting this data? What do you do with it? Most of the time they say, well, we've always collected it. Well, then it's doing nothing for you and it's potentially putting up a barrier to users whose information you want to collect and use. On top of that, if you're asking for gender, you're probably just going to do a binary, are you male or female? People identify differently. Why would you assume what they are when you can have them tell you by using an open text field or additional options? So going beyond this, it's about being responsible with the data that we want to collect and having reasons why we want to do it. So every time your client wants to collect information, every time your company wants to put up a form and gather data about a user, ask yourself, do we have a reason for collecting it? whether we're getting it actively from the user or passively through cookies or other metrics. If you don't have a reason, don't collect it. Wait until you have a reason, then collect it. Because again, uh, especially with forms, if there's a lot of form fields where you're going to tell me about yourself, I want to ask only information I need so I don't throw up a bunch of barriers to stop you from giving me that information. We have to explain how we're going to protect the data. There's a lot of reasons to do this. Uh, again, trust is hard to earn on the internet. So if you want users to provide you accurate information, tell them how you're going to protect their information and actually protect it. Um, it's important to do. Make sure you're doing it in a responsible way. And then finally, remember, users' data, it belongs to them. You're just asking to peek at it. So you have to make sure you're giving users access to control their information. This is great for you because the more you can give users access to control their data, the more accurate they're going to make it. You can take that all the way back to pillar one and learn more and more about your user base and build for their needs and make a positive impact. On top of that, you know, it's going to become um, standard that you give users complete control of their data. How many people here have heard of GDPR? There's been talks about it. Yeah, about 75% of the room. Look it up. May 25th, I want to say, late May. Um, it has a big impact, especially for uh, Europe, but in America too. If you have European visitors and you're collecting information, you have to know about GDPR and give them control about, of their data. It only helps you uh, get accurate information. So this, is a, this was a short session. So this is a, a real quick overview of these four pillars, that no user is average, so don't treat them as average. Treat them for their differences. Every user deserves equal access. Don't make assumptions about how users are accessing your products, but try to plan for the differences in how they access that data. Provide understandable content to every user. How can you say things as simply as possible? And then every user deserves our trust and respect. How can you prove to users that you need their information and that you trust them to give you accurate information and that they can control it? How many people here feel like they could agree to doing one of these pillars on their next or their current project? Raise your hand. Good, everybody in the room, that was a trick question if you didn't raise your hand. Um, because you raised your hand, you've been such a great audience, I'm going to make this as simple as possible. I'm going to remove all the words I don't need to have in there. No average, equal access, understandable content, trust and respect. Now what it boils down to, if we can do these four things, what are we going to do? But the thing we agreed to at the very beginning of this talk, we're going to make a positive impact on as many people as possible. We're going to make the, the web better, we're going to make Drupal better, we're going to make the world better. Now, I saved some time because I have a bunch of resources for everybody here. Um, this presentation, I have bit.ly links uh, for, for all these links. Uh, I have this presentation. It's annotated because I know you're not going to hear me speak with my lovely speaking voice. Uh, so every slide's annotated uh, so that you can read uh, the ideas behind it. I have a bit.ly link uh, to the left of that uh, for IDX Full. This presentation is actually a 60-minute presentation that I cut in half for, for DrupalCon. So you can view the full presentation there. Uh, it has a lot more details and examples. The Myth of Average I mentioned by Todd Rose. It's a TED Talk. Check it out. It is a real eye-opener. He, he explains how assuming average helped the US Air Force back in the 50s, or not assuming average. Inclusive Design, Excluding No Gender by Sarah Learin. That was that talk on uh, the simple way to do inclusive design is not ask about gender. Really eye-opening talk. Uh, the BBC Semantic Guidelines for your use. Uh, check it out. Make sure you're using your HTML the way it's meant to be used. And then if you haven't read this book and you're a UX developer, uh, Inclusive Design Patterns at IDX Patterns, a really great book to read. It tells you how to do carousels in an inclusive way, which, one, I hate carousels. But you, if you have to do them, do them accessibly, do them inclusively. 
Uh, so with that, I want to thank you for taking time for this short session. Uh, if you have questions, we have some time. You can come up to the mic or I can repeat it for you. But if you want to talk afterwards, you can find me on Twitter, MikeMiles86. I'll be around the conference for the rest of the conference. And again, my podcast, if you want to check it out, it's developingup.com. So a round of applause and then five minutes for questions. And, and I'll keep the resources link up there for, for anybody who wants to copy them now. Any questions? Hi there. So first of all, great talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I was wondering what sort of strategies you use if you ever run into clients who are a little bit resistant to accessibility or especially paying for it. Um, any ways you kind of get them on board with the overall concept? Yeah, so in terms of accessibility, the question was, you know, how do you get uh, clients to, who are hesitant to pay for it? Great line to tell your clients is developers are cheaper than lawyers. So That's fair. Um, <laughs> Uh, a, good, a, a great example of this, there's been a couple over the years, but I think it was in 2009, Target. Uh, they were getting sued by the um, Association for the Blind, American Association for the Blind, and because they didn't have captions on their images. And they're like, hey, this isn't acceptable. We can't understand what's on this page. You got to fix it. And Target's like, nah, I'm not going to do that. They got taken to court. It cost them millions of dollars. They had to pay the court. They lost the court case. They had to pay the court fees, and they had to pay to have their website updated. So that's a big example, but if you're having users... Uh, who are going to be accessible, uh, or you want to reach accessible users, you know, it's, it's cheaper to pay the extra developers to do it now than to pay lawyers later to fix it for you. Uh, that could be hard for your clients to swallow, but you can also say, you know, if, if you're building something to promote a product, wouldn't you want the maximum number of people to see this product to increase your revenue stream? It only helps you. So my go-to line is developers are cheaper than lawyers. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. We can also sit in awkward silence. Four minutes, if you want. You're also free to leave. You don't have to sit here. Um, but thank you. If you any more questions, please, please come up. Thank you.